pages will discuss the ethical deviant and pessimism versus negativity in animal activism, challenging the tyranny of custom and complacence in our movement and in the public domain. Karen Davis, PhD, is the founder of pres uh, and, and president of United Poultry Concerns, a nonprofit organization that promotes the, compa the compassionate and respectful treatment of domestic fowl, including a sanctuary for chickens in Virginia. Karen is the author of many published articles and several books, including Prisoned Chickens, Poisoned Eggs, and Inside Look at the Modern Poultry Industry. More than more than half more than a meal, the turkey in history. Myth, Ritual, and Reality, and the Holocaust and the Henry's Tale, a case for comparing atrocities. Karen Davis is in the American, uh, sorry, Animal Rights Hall of Fame and Outstanding Contributions to Animal Liberation. Please welcome Karen Davis. Good morning, everybody. I'm so thrilled to be here and to see all of you here. And uh, it's just a great honor and an opportunity. And uh, it's so thrilling to know there are so many people here who care so much about animals and animal liberation. So thank you for being here. And we really thank uh, Farm Animal Rights Movement for putting on this great, splendid conference. So thank you so much. Uh, there's supposed to be a picture of me out there with one of our chickens. Um, at our sanctuary in Virginia. I don't know if that picture is going to appear after all, but just so that you know that um, one of uh, our many programs that is of United Poultry Concerns is um, a sanctuary for chickens on the eastern shore of Virginia, which is one of the largest poultry producing areas of the country. That's where Patrice and I met uh, down on the eastern shore. They were in Maryland, we're in Virginia. And uh, we both know about those trucks going up and down the road day after day on the back roads, the main roads. And I saw this yesterday driving up from uh, the rural area where we live in Matchapongo, uh, up here in Washington, and just seeing truckload after truckload after truckload of baby six-week-old chickens going to slaughter. So this is the kind of uh, an area that we live in, and uh, I know firsthand uh, about the chicken industry and the turkey industry. So um, I started United Poultry Concerns 25 years ago. And at that time, as I will talk about later in a couple of other talks I'm going to be giving at this conference, uh, I was discouraged even by people in the animal advocacy movement from starting an organization for chickens. This was back in the late 1980s because I was told that I could never get an organization going and sustained, sustaining itself that focused only on chickens. Well, that was 25 years ago. So we have done more than sustain ourselves. We are very successful. So I start uh, with that um, observation. Uh, to say this, that we never ever as animal rights advocates and activists and animal liberationists, we never want to succumb to the naysay and the negative uh, uh, ideas that can discourage us from pursuing the goals that we know we need to pursue for animals and that animals so desperately need us to pursue on their behalf. So don't ever let anybody sit, tell you that something you want to do for animals can't, can't be done or that people aren't ready yet. Don't ever listen to the slogan that people aren't ready yet. Our job as animal advocates and activists is to make people ready. That's our job. Uh, my presentation, which is ethical deviance and pessimism versus negativity. So how many people in this room consider themselves an ethical deviant? <laughs> how many people in this room consider themselves, himself or herself, an ethical deviant? Okay, well, I'm getting 
definition. Because <laughs> I think when I do it, they go, maybe there will be more hands. There will be more hands. <laughs> so, um, I came up with this term, this concept, when I was preparing a presentation for a panel discussion at the uh, City College of New York a few months ago. And I had started off with a uh, very famous poem by uh, the uh, English poet William Wordsworth, Intimations on, uh, 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 on uh, Intimations of Immortality, in which he talks about the loss in growing up of his childhood rapture with nature, his, his primal sympathy with the natural world, and how as he grew older, that light darkened, and he lost that, that original feeling that he had had for the natural world in becoming an adult. So a question that many of us ask in our movement is, if we assume that most children have a primal sympathy and empathy with other animals, we're animals, so we're talking about other animals, and I, we're, our language is so limiting, we always have to use terms like non-human animals, which I don't like. So let's just say that with members of other species, with other animals, if children do have this primal sympathy within, genetically based, what happens? Why does this, an iron curtain seem to fall between the child and the adult? So that by the time people are adults, or as they are going into their teenage years, if they had that primal sympathy for animals, it becomes so overlaid with other interests, other competing emotions, competing desires, competing goals. So, if we assume that the child, so to speak, the sort of idea of the child, the concept of the child, the genetic pattern that we call the child, is in most, most of us. One thing I would say, in my experience as an animal rights activist, as well as I was a juvenile probation officer for five years in Baltimore City, and I taught English at the University of Maryland for 12 years, and so I have, been, and I even taught in a kindergarten way back when, and it was called the Little Red Hen. <laughs> and uh, at that time, it was a preschool. But, you know, two to six-year-old, six-year-old children. Um, I had no idea at that time that uh, that was uh, the name, that was who I was going to be, <laughs> so to speak. Um, but anyway, I dealt with uh, uh, young people uh, from the age of two through college. So, and then being an animal rights activist started since 1983, so I, I'm, uh, I've been around now for over 30 years, and very, very active in the animal rights movement, and having started the United Poultry Concerns then in um, 1990. So one of the things that I have found is that there are many people who care very much about animals inwardly, but many people live among other people who they're afraid of. They're afraid that other, they, other people in their community will laugh at them or ostracize them or ridicule them if they express compassion for animals. Now, you know, most people in, in our society, it's, it's uh, normative, it's acceptable to care about your, your pet dog, your pet cat, and maybe a pet canary or a parakeet. But there are still large parts of the country and in all societies, but certainly if you're living, for example, in rural areas, not necessarily only rural areas, but still there are a lot of places where, and not to speak of the entire planet, where people are hesitant to express the natural primal sympathy for animals that they feel. They fear ostracism. They fear ridicule. How many children living, for example, 
in family farms. Secretly hated the cattle branding season. Secretly hated the slaughter. Groomed and loved an animal, a cow or a pig, as part of the 4-H program. And when they finally went to the went to the auction, it was wake up for them. That this animal had been groomed and loved and petted and nurtured to be hauled into a truck and sent to a slaughterhouse. A Canadian activist and a wonderful, wonderful artist, a uh, visual artist uh, for uh, farmed animals and all kinds of animals named uh, Twyla Francois. <laughs> And a very close friend and colleague of, of mine and of many people here in this room, obviously, I'm glad to say. She described growing up in Manitoba, a very rural community, and how children are socialized to detach themselves from animals, um, to detach themselves from feelings about animals, to learn, to grow up and stop being sentimental about animals and face the real world. And an ex example she gives in a very good anthology called Sister Species, which I believe we have at our exhibit table here, and Lisa Kammerer, I believe she's maybe here in this room, uh, she is the editor of that, uh, that, that wonderful book. Um, Twyla has, Twyla Francois has an article in there in which she talks about a very close friend of hers who had raised a cow for 4-H, and when she went to the, um, whatever it is, the auction or whatever, and realized that she had to surrender her beloved cow to go to slaughter, to be loaded into the truck to go to slaughter, she started to cry, and she was so upset, and Twyla was there with her, and she said, and the auctioneer came over and quickly handed her a thousand dollar check, and Twyla wrote in her article, she said, help how shocked she was to see her friend, who was crying over her beloved cow going to this horrible slaughter, how quickly her friend brightened up and started talking about how she was going to spend the money. So what we're looking at is not only a conflict between ourselves within, our primal sympathies with animals, our empathy, our compassion, our fellowship, our sense of fellowship, but we're also looking at conflicts within ourselves because society is an extrapolation, if you will, and an extension of the psychology of humans. That's where society comes from. It is an extension and expression of our psychology. So these conflicts are not only between me and an external world, but it's within ourselves that we have to contend with. Because compassion, as strong as it is in most people, or at least many people, has to compete a lot of, against a lot of other very, very strong emotions and problems. It has to fight. You really have to fight to keep your compassion. Your compassion's head up, you might say with so many competing forces around you that really do not encourage compassion beyond a very circumscribed uh, amount of expression. So who is the ethical deviant? The eth ethical deviance, I say, is the element in society that prevents socialization from becoming sclerotic. You know, like sclerosis? where you can't move anymore, where you're just rigid and fixed. So the social deviant is the one who prevents the socializing process from becoming sclerotic. The ethical deviant opens a window to let in fresh air, fresh ideas, and fresh perceptions. The ethical deviant may be thought of as the quote-unquote child within a society who, fortunate for that society, will not grow up to be just another replica. 
The ethical deviant reassures people whose sensibilities have not been totally crushed or driven underground that they are not crazy for caring about a chicken. And an ethical deviant, as an animal rights activist, never ever says when they are out there in their advocacy role, starting their sentence or their advocacy by saying, I know a lot of people think I'm crazy for caring about a chicken, <laughs> or whoever it is they're advocating for. We never ever apologize. For those, for those animals, we have pledged to speak up for, whose dignity we have declared ourselves the upholders of. We never start out by saying, I know and I'm crazy for caring about a uh, chicken or whoever it may be. No, we're always confident. We are always self-confident. Without confidence and without courage, it doesn't matter what else we do, we are not a good advocate. We're not an advocate, in fact. An advocate, think about a court of law. An advocate is somebody who takes a strong position and makes a case for their client. That's who we are as animal advocates. We are an advocate. We don't apologize. We don't start off weak. We start off and maintain strong, strong advocacy. <laughs> so, the ethical deviant refuses to be bullied into becoming a slave or a clone in order to belong. The ethical deviant really provides a social service. In a very real sense then, an invaluable sense, the child, quote unquote, aka ethical deviant, is a grown up. In his ode on intimations of immortality, the poet, the English poet William Wordsworth, contrasts, as I said at the beginning, his instinctual, unreflecting passion for the natural world as a child with the, what he called the years that bring the philosophic mind. Um, the years that bring the philosophic mind. The years that we learn about the world as we mature. The ethical deviance primal sympathy with and insight into the life of things matures to become the conscious sensibility, the awareness and purposefulness of the adult. This person is the poet, the peacemaker, the social justice advocate, the animal rights activist. The quote unquote outsider who keeps the consciousness and conscious, conscience of society alive and growing. Some years ago, I was asked to write uh, something for a, a book on veganism. And uh, the question came up, uh, I've heard people over the years in the animal advocacy movement talk about how when they became vegan, they, they, they felt more peaceful after they became vegan. And I expressed myself this way about becoming vegan. I said, and I must still say, that veganism has not made me more feel more peaceful at all. <laughs> and capable and committed and uh, uh, confident and uh, all of those things. But in a world like this, um, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to be at peace. I, 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 I do not have peace. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, I mean, you have to maintain your sanity, but that doesn't mean you have to feel peaceful. <laughs> So I said, uh, veganism has made me more conscious of behavior patterns 
that are not consistent with my adherence to philosophic veganism. Being vegan has not made my personality more peaceful, as by some sort of physiological or mystical transformation or holistic purification. <laughs> However, it has made me more intellectually aware of my feelings and my behavior, and less able to rationalize and do certain things that I might otherwise do or overlook. It has made me more conscious, more aware. And being conscious is so important. This is where instinct becomes enlightenment. What that is our best instincts. So how much more time? Huh? Oh, okay, so I'm about done now because um, I know time is running out. So I'll just say this in conclusion, and I do, uh, let me just say this too before I come to the conclusion. Uh, if you come to our table, uh, the United Poultry Concerns in the exhibit hall, right inside the doors there, um, you can pick up uh, the um, article that I wrote that includes ethical uh, deviance, and also uh, the discussion I was going to get into here, but there's not really time to do it, on uh, uh, pessimism versus negativity, but I'll just say this. Pessimism is an assessment of the world and its prospects. Negativism is an attitude of defeatism. We must never be negative as animal rights advocates. We may be pessimistic about the way things are, but that's a whole different thing from being negative. We must never be negative. We must never, ever negate hope for animals. But we must always be strong. So I'm just going to close with this. Because this is also an important thing I hear in our movement, and I want to challenge this for everybody. An important point is that we must never take for granted that people, quote unquote, over 25 are unreachable, unteachable, or dispensable in our quest to make compassion for animals part of the socialization process. Not only is this assumption dead wrong, but children who are surrounded by adults who do not support their feelings for animals will often turn it against themselves, as well as against the animals, as a result of having had feelings of compassion for animals as children that did not seem to be shared or understood by the adults in their world. So our best hope is not five-year-olds. Our best hope is five-year-olds who are supported by adults who have matured their own primal sympathies and nurtured their own primal sympathies to maturity. So let us be those adults for all the children that are coming into this world whom animals need so much to join our ranks and be part of the next generation. Thank you.